Yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Holger. I'm uh, I'm working within the Ethereum JS project, which is a uh, which is a JavaScript project of the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, and uh, today I would like to talk a bit about the state of the JavaScript ecosystem as I see it, because I'm this this will will be very much Ethereum JS centric, but I will try to look a bit uh, beyond Ethereum JS and also look at other libraries which are which are there. Um, uh, thanks, thanks, Ralph, also for, for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm actually li living in Vienna and I attended lots of Ralph's meetups and uh, this was actually one of the reasons why I actually digged so deep into Ethereum, um, that, uh, that Ralph also, uh, always made such great presentation, presentations, so thank you for that. Um, I, heard. Um, I also, during my talk preparation, I, I, at some point I put an asterisk on this uh, ecosystem thing or on the, on the title and actually added to the title that I would like to, to talk about this in the light of a future sharded Ethereum, because I, I thought this would be maybe a bit more future-proof and a bit more interesting. So I will put everything a bit uh, in a comparison. How is the JavaScript ecosystem now, and how could it look like, or how is it already developed um, within a sharded context, and what is already there, and what will be there in the future. Um, so what is Ethereum JS? Uh, maybe a quick question. Who knows Ethereum JS? Okay, few, fewer than I thought, actually. Um, okay, so Ethereum JS is um, it's kind of historically uh, evolved a bit out of community contributions, and now it's uh, it's hosted as github.com uh, slash Ethereum JS. And uh, we are mainly doing base level infrastructure components uh, in JavaScript. So what is not Ethereum JS, for example, is, uh, is Web3.js which is a very popular library to connect to Ethereum node. But we mainly do stuff like we have a virtual machine Im implementation with a Merkle tree implementation in JavaScript, uh, an RLP library for, for data serialization on a networking level. Um, so stuff like that. And uh, one main focus of us is, uh, is uh, for sh most for sure the, the virtual machine, because this is used in, in popular dev tools, for example, like in the Remix uh, IDE. Uh, or in Truffle, in the Truffle development suite, uh, our virtual machine is, is ex actually executing the, the transaction in the background. Um, there are roughly 20 actively managed uh, repositories, and mostly it's done by the Ethereum Foundation now, but there are also other, or some repositories which are done by other people, like the Blockstream library, for example, there are some people from Augur, I think, uh, are doing these libraries. Um, we have one repository called Organization, which is for project man man management stuff. Uh, so if you've got ideas what we could do better, or if you've got, you've got suggestions, you can go there and just find an issue. And I just revived this a bit uh, because it was a bit orphaned. Um, yeah, but now it's a bit more active again, and, and we will have a look at look there, and we can can go into the thread of discussion um, yeah, if we maybe can change some stuff. Uh, we also have a Jitter channel for our communication, which is located at Ethereum slash uh, Ethereum JS. Where you can also go there if you. This is maybe or more for if you've got questions on the libraries uh, itself. Um, this is a bit the, the agenda I came up with for today. Um, so I, I will look at four centric um, blockchain specific uh, topics on the virtual machine. Uh, the, the consensus uh, layer, architecture of clients and, and developer tools. And I will talk a bit about what is in Ethereum 1.0, what is the current state, what JavaScript libraries do we have, and also yeah, what, what are the characteristics uh, for, for current Ethereum 1.0 um, structure. And then I will move on a bit to sharding. And, um, and at some point it was obvious what it would take for sharding, and at some point also I had to come up with Stuff because there is also there are also areas where there is not so much there and I just um, had to think about um, imagine a bit myself what what could be there in sharding. Okay, I'll give, I'll give a short sharding introduction. This is, this talk is not primarily about sharding, but just to to give you an overview of what the sh state of sharding is right now. Um, and sharding a lot changed lately uh, at the moment. Um, We've got an official work in progress uh, specification, which is the Casper and Sharding uh, chain version 2.1 specification. And this was a long time, this was in some notes, um, document or notes that Ethereum JS, and it's just moved a couple of days, moved 
to a dedicated uh, repository at uh, on, on GitHub on Ethereum slash east 20 stack. So this is now it's easier to find, but it's already a win. Um, and this is the main specification, which turned out now to be the primary blueprint for implementing sharding. Um, then we've got these east 20 implementer calls, which Ralph already mentioned. And, and I can highly recommend to look at these notes from these, these calls. And because these are highly, or you just listen to the call itself, but it's a bit quicker to look at the notes. And the notes are also very, very detailed and give a very good overview of what is talked about at the moment, uh, what, are the, what are the main topics, what are the research topics, if you want to dig that deep into that. And you will, there's also a repository for that, east 20 dash pm, and you will also stumble on it if you follow uh, the Reddit channel on our Ethereum. <coughs> the main thing going on on the, uh, on the implementation side is, um, is from a team called Prismatic Labs. I don't know who, who knows Prismatic Labs, just to get a bit of an idea of, okay. So Prismatic Labs is, is just a team which formed out of nowhere in, in New York, and they were so good that after a couple of months they got really, um, substantial grant from the Ethereum Foundation, like several hundred thousand dollars, I think. And now they are doing the main implementation of sharding at the moment on a repository called PRISM. Um, and if you want to uh, to really look into the code for sharding, then that's the main place uh, to go into the PRISM repository. You can just search for Prismatic Labs on, on Google. And Prismatic Labs, already what they also they do really solid implementation, but what they also do is they do bi-weekly updates on their blog. And that's not just only telling what they're implementing right now, but they're doing a lot of, they're talking a lot about the context on what they're implementing, why are they implementing that, and explaining uh, the, the background structures of these as well. So these blog posts are also highly recommended if you go, want to go into sharding. Um, on the sharding introduction level, it's getting a bit more difficult because so much changed so so lately. So if you Google, for example, Ethereum sharding medium, you want to find some medium articles on sharding. A lot of these articles are kind of outdated because it's sharding spec changed so significantly. And this is, uh, some might be worth to read. I, I have nothing to recommend specifically, but um, yeah, you have to look at, especially at the dates of the, of the articles because if, if the article is, nine months ago or so, and even six months ago, then it's kind of outdated, and yeah. yeah. And otherwise, if, if you can wait a couple of weeks more uh, until you want to really get deeper into sharding, you can also wait for the DEF CON 4 talks um, being recorded and published, because sharding will be the mega topic at, at the DEF CON presentation, and there will be lots of talks in sharding. Um. So uh, some history on sharding. Um, yeah, actually, I, I thought about should I talk about sharding history or or not? Is it going to be? But I, then I thought I, I can't uh, talk about sharding with not mentioning the history because uh, actually in, it was just June 2018 that the sharding and the Casper roadmap changed completely, and then this was a time where Vitalik uh, was in the Cordex call and it was Cordex call number 40. And that was kind of decided or published that uh, before there was the structure was that there was a sharding manager contract, which is a contract in, in Solidity or, or Viper, I think, it's another um, uh, contract language, language. And this contract was managing um, validators for the shards and then doing shard relevant stuff. And also Casper, the Casper FFG, was also mainly put into a contract, um, <coughs> the Casper FFG contract. And this changed completely, and now there's a um, a separate, a dedicated chain just for sharding, and this is called the beacon chain. This is kind of the central part now of um, of sharding. Um, and this unifies a lot of things. This unifies the shard manage management and also puts Casper FFG, which before was um, for for giving finality to, to the main chain. So this was, was a proof of stake me mechanism for just uh, validating um, or, or um, finalizing blocks on the main chain, and now this concept is generalized, and the Casper concept is also taken, the proof of stake concept is also taken for um, for validating shards and uh, for getting a unique uh, or unified view on the latest state of the shards. Um, 
So before we had some kind of double structure, and that was also kind of realized by the research team, um, that they're just implementing on various locations the, the same stuff, like validating uh, stuff and, and, um, and finalizing blocks or charts or whatever. And now we have a, less, a much cleaner architecture, which is also less intrusive, um, because it's not directly connected to a, to a contract on the main chain, which is then executed at the end or at the beginning of the new block cycle. Then there was always this shard uh, processing or Kafka processing, uh, which is just which was just very tightly connected to the main chain, and which also also had some limitations on scaling because uh, now we can do much more uh, shards. I think it's now going up to one. We can now theoretically do one thousand shards because it's a much more separated uh, structure we have now. So there's no mainnet bottleneck, but bottleneck mirror and, and much better scaling. Um, so it might be, um, I don't know how, how it was for you, if, if you heard about this earlier. And for me, it was a bit frustrating because it was another delay of Kafka and Earth, and everything is delayed. But at the end, I'm very, very sure that we come up with a much better, much more solid structure for, for a shard and scaling Ethereum for the next decade or so, or, or even two decades. So some, some overview on the structure, we, we now, on, in sharding and sharded Ethereum, we have the main chain, and uh, this is more or less unchanged, unchanged, except that it forwards staking requests to the beacon chain. So you can deposit, I think, 32 ETH in a contract on the main chain, and this is kind of then um, burned or um, put aside or something, and this is then forwarded, forwarded to the beacon chain, and then you, then you are participating in the proof of stake mechanism in the beacon chain. And this is then used for validation, like I said before, for validation of the shard state. So um, um, the latest block hash of a shard is then put into the, put into the beacon chain. And this is called a cross main. Um, so that um, in the beacon chain, we have got just a unified view of the state of the different shards. And the shard state is kind of validated so that um, yeah, um, we can work with this with the latest state. And then we've got a shard chain, so we've got a third type of chains. Um, and there in the, in the shard change, chains, uh, sorry, which can can be re, yeah, rethought kind of very, very much from the bottom up. Uh, we've got the actual data, we've got transactions, and we've got some kind of virtual machine running, ex executing the transaction, and doing all the stuff we, we had before on the main chain, and we still will have on the main chain. We have some some picture on this, so yeah, so there's a main chain at the top, which provides uh, the input for for staking. Then there is a, a chain for this beacon chain. And one main topic for the beacon chain is also to provide random numbers and generated in a distributed fashion. So this is also this is a high highly discussed research topic, like how to generate random numbers and how to generate them from from within a distributed nature and do this unbiased so that they are good random numbers. Which can be taken for for taking from the validator pool some some validators which actually do the validation processes because otherwise um, you can have various types of attacks um, if you just have some pseudo pseudo random numbers which can be guessed before uh, and then with the shard chains um, below uh, it's it's okay if you don't get everything from every block from this picture um, there are the shard chains below which actually provide the data and where the VM is taking. Uh, is, is executing um, transactions. This is actually not not my um, not my diagram. I put text, took this from Xiaowei Wang, which is a researcher at the Ethereum uh, Foundation. <coughs> okay, that was some introduction to sharding. I'm now going in, in the first topic, which uh, which is a virtual machine, and this is again a bit uh, the agenda for that. So what are the current characteristics for, for the virtual machine in Ethereum? So at the moment we've got a, a stack-based 256-bit uh, virtual machine. So this is kind of a bit different than the, the, the normal design of, of current computers uh, with 64-bit. We have over 100 opcodes and these opcodes are kind of like um, um, dedicatedly invented for, for the Ethereum virtual machine. So this is 
what's uh, this is all written up in the, in, the, in the yellow paper. And there are opcodes for, for um, arithmetic operation and uh, specific Ethereum specific um, opcodes like address or balance, which are requesting mm -hmm. the current address or the current balance, um, or opcodes for calling into other contracts and many more. And, um, and the thing is also their opcode uh, count is continually growing. So now in Constantinople, we've got two more, uh, we will have two more opcodes, uh, like what Ryan talked about. Um, this is Xcode hash and create two. So, so the thing is actually getting more complex over time as well. Um, one thing is also they, they are pre-compiled in the current uh, virtual machine, uh, which means that you, um, for some operations are too cost intensive um, and you just can't do them in a, in a uh, contract, in a solidity contract or something. And so for, for something like a hash generation, which is for, exa uh, for example here in SHA256 hash, which is kind of a, uh, the, the, the hash standard used in Ethereum. This would be too cost expensive, so there would be too much gas used for that. And so this is then implemented natively in the code of the different node implementations, like in JavaScript or in, in Go or in, in Rust. Um, yeah, and this pre also adds complexity to the, to the whole virtual machine level. Um, other characteristics are that uh, the virtual machine has to be de deterministic which means it also, or, uh, always has to come to the same result. So this is kind of, uh, the, the pre-definition um, of, of the blockchain. Uh, and it, it is in Ethereum's um, context, it is Ethereum complete, so can more or less uh, calculate everything you would expect from a computer. Um, one example here in, in JavaScript is, um, <coughs> One example on, on opcodes, for example. Um, so you start um, you start with a solidity contract. The solidity contract is uh, compiled into bytecode, um, and these bytecodes represent represent actually the different opcodes plus some values in, in hex um, uh, written in hex. So zero x is this means it's a hex value, hexadecimal value, and this opcode is kind of forwarded to a virtual machine and then executed. Um, and if you look at the, this, this is actually some part of, uh, of our uh, JavaScript virtual machine impl implementation. And this is, this is the whole implementation in Node.js uh, for the block hash uh, of code. So this is ju just plain Node.js code. So it's provided the number and at the end, um, JavaScript blockchain object, um, um, a, a block is requested from a JavaScript block hash, a block, blockchain object uh, with its number, and then the block hash is read um, and passed back to the virtual machine where this is put on a stack or, or on memory, and then this is operated onwards, uh, on, um, and there are more operations onwards on this. So this is, this is kind of just as a short example how, how we have implemented this stuff. Um, this is an example for a precompile, just to give you an idea for that. This is the hash precompile I talked about earlier. Um, this is also the whole precompile, and this um, the main thing is just here down there. This is actually just it's just calling a JavaScript function SHA256. So it's, it's just using the native JavaScript uh, code or in Go it would be, <coughs> would be analog um, to call this hash function. So this is precompile. And when we do uh, New development for for new um, for a new hard fork, for example, not for Constantinople. We have to do this for Xcode hash, and then there are tests, external tests, um, which have to pass so that every every client stays in, in consensus. Um, yeah, this is our, our JavaScript uh, virtual machine. This is called Ethereum JS VM. So. Every more or less all our libraries are kind of pre fixed with the CMJS. Um, and this is actually a Byzantium, at the moment, this is a Byzantium compatible virtual machine. Uh, our Constantinople is currently a work in progress. I hope that we can finish this in the next two, three, four weeks, but I won't promise. Um, so this would be good uh, actually because um, then developers can use this or then Remix can deploy this so that uh, people can use um, Constantinople features in Remix, for example, or in Truffle. So 
we are kind of in a hurry because we know that developers use this for other work and to test their contracts, for example. Um, this, uh, so our virtual machine, uh, this works in a browser, and yeah, like I said, use cases are, for example, Trust and Nginx. Uh, this also has a relatively clear structure, so if you want to dig a bit deeper into a virtual machine and you know how to read JavaScript, uh, then one way would be, for example, to, to go into our repository. Um, this is yeah, really relatively clear to read on a file level already. We, we start on run blockchain JS, uh, then um, run block JS is called uh, on a specific block. Then the block is um, uh, separated into transactions, and then run transaction is called, and all the, and yeah, all the pre and post processing is, is taking place, um, like. Um, um, calculating gas costs or stuff like that, or emitting lock events or stuff like that. Um, and this is going down until the opcode level, like the, the file is, I think it's called op fns, fn, op functions JS or op fns JS. And there you can really see the code of the different opcodes like I presented earlier. So if you're interested in digging deeper into the virtual machine, uh, this is one way uh, you could go. Actually, this is much better than reading the, the yellow paper. I started with the yellow paper and I just got completely desperate after some time uh, because I, I couldn't read it. Um, um, yeah, so what are sharding specific needs for a virtual machine? Uh, there, there are no so much specific needs, but um, since we are starting fresh with shard chains, um, we now have the freedom of choice and um, there's no real need for backwards compatibility. So, and since the current virtual machine design is not so optimal in terms of performance and then also in terms of design complexity, uh, we can start fresh here. Uh, and this is where, where eWASM comes in. Um, yeah, so most for sure on the shirt there will be eWASM um, as the standard language uh, or the standard virtual machine for, for executing these contracts. Um, eWASM is a, uh, is a deterministic subset of WebAssembly. Um, so, so WebAssembly is kind of like a um, native language standard for the web, which is kind of um, which kind of major browser uh, vendors like Mozilla and, and, and Microsoft and Apple and I think everyone worked on WebAssembly. This is now incorporated in the browser, and we use and we will use a, a subset of, of WebAssembly, which uh, makes it deterministic. So the results are always the same. And add some Ethereum specific <coughs> interface to that called Ethereum Environment Interface, EEI. This is just um, providing some functions which can be called get address, get block hash, which are, which are a bit similar to the opcodes I presented earlier. Um, and you can see a bit some WebAssembly codes there. You don't need to be able to really read that, it's just as an, as an impression what's going on there. And this is kind of like a standardized set of instructions. Um, and this allows actually for, for faster code execution. Um, there won't, probably won't be the need for pre-compiled, so hard forks get much, much easier, um, or also less frequent. And the one, one of the main benefits is that there is a promise that smart contracts can be uh, developed in traditional languages. So you don't have to rely on Solidity anymore, um, but you can develop smart contracts and in the, in the supported uh, WebAssembly languages, which are C, C++, or Rust. Um, and we can also use a whole tool chain uh, from WebAssembly. WebAssembly is a huge effort, um, and, and there's a whole community around this WebAssembly uh, stuff, and we can use all the tools like compilers and, and developer tools or whatever, um, and don't have to do this ourselves. Uh, there, there will also be much more uh, on this at DEF CON 4, um, yeah, if you're interested in that, uh, check out also the DEFCON talks. Um, and there, there's a dedicated eWASM team at the Ethereum Foundation, and all the code produced there you can also find in github.com slash eWASM. One thing which is particularly interesting in, in, within, in the JavaScript context is a language um, called AssemblyScript. Um, and this is actually, I have found the super exciting stuff. Um, this is a restricted set of TypeScript. Um, so, um, so TypeScript is a, is a superset of JavaScript with, with types. Um, 
and this is a restricted set of TypeScript. I'm actually, I'm no TypeScript expert. I just read this from the documentation that there is no any type, which just loosens TypeScript a bit again to to allow different types again, um, so to make make this a bit more compatible with JavaScript. But this is a bit on the low ground. I'm not sure if I'm correct here. Uh, so at least it's, this is restricted a bit. And, this, and assembly script compiles down to WebAssembly and actually creates very small binaries, uh, which can very well be used in a blockchain environment. And there, at the moment, there are experiments within the eWorldon team to make um, assembly scripts an officially supported eWorldon language. So, and this will mean that you will be able to actually use JavaScript or TypeScript to do your smart contracts. And I think this is, this is pretty exciting. So uh, here at the right, there's some uh, some code how such a contract could look like. These are just experiments from the I took randomly from the eWorldon repository. So don't take this as a code how things will look like, but just as an idea how things could look like. Um, there are also there is also some code you can find in the eWorldon repository and GitHub. And um, there's kind of some more or less I think this is more or less the official IDE for WebAssembly. Uh, development environment for WebAssembly at WebAssembly.studio, and you can also go there. And Assembly Script is actually an officially supported language there as well. So you can open a template in Assembly Script. So that's there. You can see this is just not some side project from someone, but this is kind of getting getting real. And this will hopefully allow um, yeah contracts in JavaScript. Okay, that was everything to the to the virtual machine topic. Now, move on to to consensus and uh, to to coordination of uh, how the blockchain is created. Um, what uh, what have we got now? Um, we've got the ET hash uh, proof of work algorithm and mining. Um, proof of work is hashing together some random values from a large data set called the DAG. Um, and the result has to be below a certain threshold, um, depending on the difficulty. And um, the DIG, also this data set, is, is changing frequently, so this makes this memory hard and relatively hard for, for Essex uh, to work on. But I'm also I'm not, I'm not super much proof of work uh, expert, so I'm, I'm not sure about the specifics about progressive proof of work and what's in the discussion there. But generally, that's generally the, the idea. Um, and this is distributed to the network via RPC um, methods. And the main, main methods here are either get work to get some work from miners, and then the miners submitting uh, the work with the subnetwork. Um, and then you get a mining or a re reward for your mining, and this leads to kind of these 12 second uh, block times. Uh, in JavaScript, we also have got an ETH hash implementation. Um, this code is taken from this. Uh, uh, from this library, it's called ethash.js, which is a working ethash Im implementation, which is also good for learning if you just want to look into this algorithm and get a rough idea what's going on there. But it's also slow, so because it's JavaScript. Um, so if you want to have this a bit more performance, there is we also have a bindings library, which just binds this to the C++ implementation, um, which is called node-ethash. Uh, but uh, since I'm not, not su super much a proof of work expert and also not so super much an expert for these libraries, um, you have to look at this yourself if, if this is useful for you because um, I'm not, uh, not that sure about that. Um, probably mostly mining is used with other clients uh, like Parity or Geos because there you've got the performances uh, where mining is taking place. But we have put implementation in JavaScript for this as well. Um, so now in, in sharding, um, like I said, we now have the beacon chain. Um, and so um, before this whole, this whole um, blockchain validation was kind of like some algorithm was in the, the main clients. Now we've got a separate proof of stake chain, um, which is uh, uh, explicitly uh, um, um, responsible for, for all this proof of stake mechanism. And so the proof of stake, a validation mechanism is similar to the original customer mechanism, like I talked a bit before. Um, so there, a block there, you've got a pool of validators. So everyone who's, who's given this 32 ETH is getting into a pool of validators. Then there's this 
with, with the help of this random number generation, then there's uh, someone selected as a block proposer, which can propose a block. Um, and this block propose, this block actually um, yeah, contains, mainly contains information about the shards. So, um, it's, like I said, it's called a crosslink. So this is a confirmation of the latest state of the shards, so, so that we have a unified view um, on the different on the different shards, which are pop, which will pop, pop up. And the block proposer is proposing a block, and then a committee of a testers is selected, and these testers confirm um, if this block is valid. And if this block is valid, then the, this is a proof of stake thing. Then the proof of then the proposer gets a reward. And if this is not valid, then then uh, proposer's um, stake gets slashed or at least partially slashed. So that's kind of the, the, the Casper mechanism mechanism from before, but on a generalized uh, level. And this validation mechanism is still used for main chain finality, which gives. Um, um, you can also talk about uh, you can also see talks about um, uh, this on, on, on you can see the former Casper talks which are still very much valid on concepts like finality or something. And finality is just some stronger guarantee um, that a block won't revert on the blockchain, but I couldn't explain this much further. Um, and on, on with this concept of sharding, we've got minimal main chain changes. So there is this additional deposit contract, which is just contract which at some point gets deployed and there is one new client method called prioritize which is given a block hash and a value for this finality thing um, and this won't be a very complex method this is just one method which has to be added to the clients uh, who implement um, uh, the main chain logic like uh, GSL parity so and otherwise the, the main chain stays unchanged and this is much less of a risk for yeah, for the actually running main chain Ethereum Um, we also have some implementation of a beacon chain in um, in JavaScript, uh, which is called Lodestar chain. Um, so if you want, if you into JavaScript and want to get an idea of sharding, you can also start there. With, this is under chain state systems. I think this is a consultancy uh, team. Um, and I had at some look at this. This is um, this is not so far in. Its development stage. So it just gives some some basic, provides some basic implementations of the various state objects which are relevant in the beacon chain context, like the crosslink. You know, as a like writer put the code for a crosslink, or a block in a beacon chain, or the crystallized state, which is another concept of, of um, state changes. Um, yeah, but it, it's it's not going very much farther, and it's not implementing the actual logic. Of the beacon chain, how, how everything is processed there. So you get get some first idea, but if you want to look into code, uh, I recommend to look at this Prismatic Labs um, code and this Prism implementation. Even if this is in Go, and you may be not so much into Go. Um, and Prismatic Labs is uh, pretty pretty new. Actually, they now released their first um, release uh, on the beacon chain. And in the last week, you can read a blog post on this, and they they named it very humbly version 0.0.0, .0 and uh, this is extremely humbly because uh, there's an extreme amount of work already done in this um, um, this release, but many things are just, um, some things work, and some things just are, are just simulated. But th this is kind of actually, I think, the first release where you can see sharding in action, and then this is kind of a bit similar, like when you, you're starting a GE's client on the console and see, look at all the, all the console output, and you can now you can with relatively easy steps like it's like half a page of instructions you can install this and then you actually really see uh, a beacon chain client in action and this actually makes uh, all these uh, these concepts like cross things and or, or everything which is going on and all the terminology much more gives this much more grasp because if you read the specs and you're you're kind of like often or at least it was for me it was like that you're often lost again and again because you just can't really say well, what is a dynasty and what's the what's the what's all this stuff and what's a crystallized state. And if you see this in a in a in a log uh, output and see actually some interaction, this gets much much more real. So um, maybe this is one of the best things to to start and get excited about sharding. And this in the, in the latest blog post is described how you how you can start with it.
Okay, so now, now it's about, um, I will talk about the client architecture and how this, our client will differ in a sharded and in a not sharded Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, and, and client is also, I will talk about this a bit more uh, later, but uh, the client means really the shard clients in a sharded context. And this is very much uh, work in progress, and then there are many things which still need to be determined. Uh, so, um, yeah, so this is, I will focus a bit on, on the networking layer and, and some other things, but there, this is one of the topics where there's much, uh, very wide in the open. Uh, so what are the current, current characteristics of, um, of um, current client, for Ethereum? Mm. Mm. So, so we have the Ethereum virtual machine 1.0 as the execution engine, which I already talked about. It is kind of slow. It uses pre-compiled. It has a small community to move forward on, on, on with. Um, current clients are always stateful. So stateful just means you need to store state uh, in some amount of block hashes or the, all the blocks. And this is, this is true both for, for all types of nodes, like for full clients, for fast clients, and even for light clients. You have to store uh, state, which, which, uh, which leads to long download times uh, and a large disk space used um, on your hard drive. Um, communication flow, on the other hand, is, uh, at the moment is relatively easy because you're just communicating inside the, the blockchain and then uh, in between accounts. So you can create, you can call into other accounts, um, and, and that's it. And this is well proven, this is how Ethereum works uh, now for uh, some years. Yeah, in the, in, in the shard world, this is getting more complex. Um, and the networking communication is, is uh, done via guest P2P, which is a, which also a, a, um, some, um, some protocol which is just developed for Ethereum. Um, and this can also be loosened um, with, with using lib P2P, which is a standard protocol. But I'll, I'll come to this later. Um, in JavaScript, we also we now also have a, a client implementation, or at least this is in development, uh, which, which is, uh, is which you can find at Ethereum JS client. So kind of like a classical mainnet client, and this is in development since April 2018, uh, and led by Vinay Poulin, um, and will implement fast and light sync. Um, um, modes for, for syncing the blockchain. Um, and we're actually at least at a state where, where blocks are, are synced and uh, in, in fast sync mode, in light sync mode. Um, and you can already run this if you go to our repository uh, over there. So this won't be a consensus critical client um, because of the limitations of JavaScript, uh, but, this is, um, but we want to use this both for education. So if, you just, if you're into JavaScript and you want to know how a client works, you can go to you can use our client uh, to know something about the Ethereum ecosystem, and we want to use this for experimentation. Um, so we have got very loosely coupled components with a generalized uh, and unified structure. So there are classes like class protocol, and then subclasses ease protocol and LES protocol, and in the future, uh, the Whisper SHH protocol, or there is a gener generic class server and uh, subclasses are the X server or the P2P server on for the networking layer. And uh, this is uh, this is mainly the work from Vinay, uh, who makes this very loosely coupled and very highly re reusable. And so we can, uh, in the future, the hope is that we can do lots of research on this for, uh, around networking, around sharding, uh, by just, for example, exchanging the networking protocol or something. And one thing I'm especially excited about is this, this, that this is implicitly hardening the other SCMJS library. Um, because the SCMJS is historically very much running just in simulation context. Like in Remix, it is just um, not the actual blockchain uh, run on this, but some test uh, transactions or some test code. And um, by developing a, a client, our virtual machine will implicitly also run the real net, main net transactions. And this is one of my hopes that. Actually, we, we through this we get the especially the virtual machine closer to the real thing by having to process the um, um, the real mainnet transactions and 
seeing it is confirmed, or if it con um, goes along with, with the result of the other implementation. So what do, what do we have for sharp clients? Um, like this is not too confused with the beacon chain node. So these are, um, yeah, these are uh, the clients for the shards. Um, like I said, there are very many to, to be determined and this is very much uh, open research. Um, and I asked uh, ask our researcher, uh, Xiao Wei Wang, on this. Uh, and, and so, because I'm also not, not, uh, not an expert on this. Um, so we, we will have Evolver as an execution engine, like I already said. Um, there's a lot of research going on in stateless clients, and I think there are promising research results already, um, so that you won't have the need uh, to store state which uh, makes it, which will make a serious uh, client actually much more usable because you just can start the client and then you're you're on the network. Mm -hmm. um, there are some. This is there's this is not super super pure. Um, uh, there is not just a super pure concept, but there are also some kind of mixed versions where you have to download some minimal state. Um, yeah, but there's a lot of research going in this direction that you just are quasi stateless, um, so you don't need to, to download state anymore. Um, so, and we have got, before we've got just communication between accounts, and now we've got cross shard communication. And this is also one big research topic. So, how do um, transactions come from one uh, shard to the other, and how is this communication taking place? Uh, the main question is there uh, are we doing this asynchronously, or are we do doing this synchronously? And synchronously would mean we're doing this within one transaction, and you get the result within this one transaction, which would be which would be what you what you would expect, and would would be much more convenient for the users. But this has some um, special challenges, and there's also at the moment it's, I think it's there is a new tendency in the synchronous direction. Um, there's also <coughs> a post on the research forum uh, about that, um, or some some proposal from Vitalik. Uh, how you can do that, um, but this is also very much uh, work and, and uh, research in progress. Uh, and we will use uh, the SLIP P2P library for the network communication, and I, on the sharding and, and JavaScript uh, side, I, wanna, I will focus just on, on the SLIP P2P um, section, and I will do two more slides on the P2P because everything else is just very much um, uh, work in progress or research in progress, and uh, the P2P is relatively settled that there will be lip 2 p as a networking uh, communication technology. So just some, I, I will just give some, some short introduction into, into the uh, P2P. So this, this is a bit like, um, um, so this is actually the networking stack um, of Ethereum, and this is doing the, we do the transport on the, on the serialized data layer. Um, like there is, there is a discovery process where you, this is this, all this distributed nature with, with having peers which have to connect to each other through the discovery process. Uh, and in our implementation, this is called, uh, which is uh, called DEF P2P, uh, um, or, or Ethereum JS DEF P2P, this is uh, DP, called DPT, uh, or um, uh, this, you've got a distributed peer table. Um, then you have to transport the data, and in the classic Ethereum, this is called RLPX. So just really make, make up some. Uh, some communication channel and then do some um, back and forth hello and, and uh, having, having have a channel ready ready to actually transport data and then you put application the application data and application is still very much on the low side um, so um, this is in, in the classic Ethereum this is called the East protocol or the LES protocol where you just actually transport blocks or transport transactions or request transactions from other peers um, <coughs> this is dedicatedly uh, um, constructed for Ethereum in the, in the classic world, and now we've got the, um, this lip to this project, which is uh, just also like a bit like WebAssembly, um, a generic community effort for just building up net networking layers, and we can very easily use this uh, now for the for the networking communication in in a sharded Ethereum. This is also it also has a much a bit like in WebAssembly. It's such a, there's a much larger community. Um, this also works in the browser, which is also a big advantage, so that it, it will be easier to make clients for the browser, which is also a big thing. 
Um, yeah, and if you're interested in the networking layer, um, you can go to github.com slash uh, p where you will find a specification of this, uh, of this uh, technology. You will, find, you will find reference implementations in Go and in, in JavaScript as well. Um, yeah, networking um, is, is really hard stuff. Um, yeah, and um, so I just, um, yeah, but it, it, it's kind of interesting to, to dig a bit into that um, because this is very much all these peer-to-peer -peer mechanisms which are which are just very relevant for Ethereum. Um, yeah, at the end, it also boils down to some some Node uh, JS code um, where events are emitted. I don't know if you know this uh, Node. Your you have this event uh, event framework, and you have. Um, on the left, we've got the Ethereum JS Dev P2P implementation. On the right, the JS Lib P2P implementation. I won't explain this code here. Just at the end, there are just some events emitted peer edit, for example. Um, there is in the networking layer, there always stuff taking place, like a new peer was added and your connection to the peer was lost. And then you can react on, on what happened there. And um, actually, on the Dev P2P, you've got peer edit as an, an, an event. And, in lib P2P, you've got peer discovery as an event. So there are some some similarities there. Um, yeah, but I won't. Sorry, I won't go deeper into that. Um, just to give you an impression, what's there, what 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 will be used in the future, and you can have a lib P2P and read the specification if you're interested in that. Um, last topic I have on the plate is developer tools. Um, so this is uh, kind of this is a topic which is completely in the open um, because I think developer tools are just uh, this is just often the topic which is coming at on, the, on the last um, of the chain. You know, the first the infrastructure is growing and then at the end the tools are coming, um, building upon the infrastructure and providing tools which make life easier for developers, like an, an IDE or a compiler or whatever, or just tools for connecting to um, to the network. Um, I just would like to, to take one um, example of a tool we have today. Um, let's see, overview. Um, um, one example of a tool we have today, which is Ether's, the Ether's JS library. Um, this is actually not an Ethereum JS project, but done by a third party developer. And this is a very popular JavaScript library. Uh, I've gotten lots of lots of traction in the last uh, month because um, there's a third party developer doing very solid implementation of a wallet with account management, um, of getting JavaScript objects from an API, so from a contract uh, um, contract interface, connecting to Ethereum nodes through different providers through some classical JSON RPC mechanism um, or through MetaMask. So there there are some there are similarities to to this uh, Web3.js library. But there are also some, some other functionality provided in, in this Ether's.js library. Um, you can deploy contracts, you can um, execute or communicate with contract methods. Yeah, this is well tested and documented. Uh, and this is also using TypeScript. Um, uh, we are a bit behind them, uh, in that. So this is also kind of a library I'm looking at where, where uh, when I want to have inspiration that we could do better on some fonts. Yeah, if if you now look at um, or uh, if you now have a, have a look into sharding and just try to imagine how would this library look like in a sharded um, sharded Ethereum world, where would should where would this library have to change? Um, yeah, you, you find that there is just very much still in the open um, and, and on the sharding front. So, for example, I ask me the question, what would be the ABI ABI format in a sharded Ethereum? Uh, which is EVOS on contracts, for example. And then I just found, I found only one reference when Googling on the EVOS repository or on the organization on an issue from 2016, actually. Uh, and I, I'm just quoting this, uh, since EVOS changes the word size from 256 bit to at most 64 bit, it is important to state whether it, whether it will follow the same ABI for contract data passing or define a new one, uh, more appropriate to its word size. 
So it's completely in the open. Um, yeah, and probably there were some changes, but this is an example for something which is just completely undefined um, and not yet determined in the sharding world. Um, on the question of connecting to a node, um, what would have to change there on the functionality side? Yeah, you, you can ask yourself the question, connect to which shard? Um, would there be a unified um, functionality to connect to all shards available in the, in the shard network? Um, there are also new infrastructure challenges. So uh, imagine an Infura. Infura is actually a service um, where you can connect uh, through an API to an Ethereum node without having to run your own node, which is very useful for developers and for, for different kinds of purposes. And uh, yeah, imagine an Infura for 1,000 shards and then Infura has to maybe run 1,000 blockchains or, or so. So there are really new infrastructure challenges on that. Um, there's a question, what, what language uh, or, um, will be used actually to talk to a node, what, what API? At the moment, we've got this defined JSON RPC uh, API um, with all these different methods uh, to talk to a node, and likely this will also change in a sharded world. Uh, so will there be a unified API for all shards, or will, there, will shards have some specific functionality which uh, also needs some specific language to talk to, and how will, will this affect the um, tooling world or the overall uh, ecosystem and the standardization of all this stuff? Yeah. And lastly, there's the topic of contracts. Um, yeah, now we've got eWASM bytecode instead of uh, EVM bytecode. Um, um, compilation from various languages, not just Solidity. Uh, will Solidity even be compatible with eWASM? And um, yeah, I looked for this in, in the eWASM FAQ, and the answer actually was maybe. So um, yeah, um, we will see what this will bring. Probably there will be some cross compilation stuff, so um, you won't have to be afraid that uh, your solidity knowledge will be worth nothing anymore in the sharded world, but there will definitely, probably there will be a shift to, to the other languages, and this will, this is also very much in the open, how this will play out, um, will the other languages become dominant, or is this just a brain-dead idea to, to use these other languages, and are they just too, too generic for, for doing smart contracts? Hopefully not. Um, yeah, very much in the open. Um, yeah, then there's a change way to interact with contracts and eventually an updated ABI. Yeah, so, so lots, of, lots of open questions there. Um, yeah, lots of open questions. Um, and if, you, if you're interested in these open questions, you can also directly go to the research forum at ETH Research, this URL over there. Um, and um, really dig very deep or directly dig into the the actual discussions on various topics like cross-shard communication um, um, or, or random number generation and really see what's, what's discussed there. Um, for me, this is often on a level that I can't really follow what's going on there because uh, it's at some point too much uh, mathematics. Uh, but it depends on, on what expert you are. Uh, you, can, you can go there. Uh, so many open questions, but um, there's also happened really a lot in the, in the shard world, and I'm, I'm really excited about sharding. Um, if you, for example, look at the implementation of Prismatic Labs, you really see an enormous amount of work already being done. Um, yeah, I think it's on a very very good track, and I'm really excited to see what, what uh, this will bring for the future of Ethereum. Um, so yes, this was my talk for today. Thank you very much. much about main chain changes. Um, actually, th this is one, one topic which is a bit uh, orphaned at the moment. I have the impression of what will actually change on the main chain because 
everyone is just so focused on the beacon chain and on, on, on the shark chains uh, to some part. And many, at the moment, the main research is actually going on in, in, the, in the beacon chain world. And I have, have no uh, current uh, idea if, if um, the main chain will also transition to, to the TTP. And this is a bit, I'm also, for me, the main chain changes in the future are a bit, still a bit black box. Um, I'm also not sure about this proof of work to proof of stake transition. I didn't find lots of this as well on the main chain. So, or will this always stay on proof of work? I hope not. Um, yeah, many things uh, uh, are known there on this front. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, so do you think it would be uh, feasible to run a light client implementation in a browser uh, in the future? There is work in this direction. Um, and um, it would be much more feasible with this block hash refactoring, which is always delayed. Um, this ERP for what Ralph mentioned. Um, and one blocker is also this, this dev TTP networking layer, and with the switch. To live to this would be much easier, um, but as I said, I'm not sure if this is coming to to the mainnet at some point. Um, maybe at the moment we are kind of in a very in a transition period, which takes a bit long, um, and it's a bit hard to always give this this answer. Wait for sharding, um, but in a sharded world, many things will just be much easier and different. Um, I don't know if this is so satisfactory to just say wait for two years um, and then sharding it there. Um, but uh, it's definitely uh, definitely the case that the, that, uh, the mainnet has lost a bit some some focus uh, or the work on the mainnet. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not sure. And uh, related to this, uh, this lib PTP, this is not uh, as I understand. Is it? Exclusive to Ethereum, or is this a generic implementation? No, it's a to super to generic implementation. Yeah. It was this mainly which was mainly developed for IPFS. I don't know yeah. if you know that. This is kind of the interplanetary file system, which is a distributed file system, also very generic, where you just can store files in a peer-to-peer -peer manner. And lib 2 p is just extracting the best practices uh, of what, what people experience with developers trying to implement their own networking stack in an internet environment. Um, I mean, the, the lib peer to peer and other ways of uh, distributing blockchain data whatsoever, transactions or blocks or shards or whatever, uh, isn't exclusive to be used with one library. There can be like a multitude of uh, different uh, peer to peer uh, protocols uh, in, in place at the same time. So uh, it could I be upgraded. I think you can adopt the lib peer to peer very much to your need because the generic general specification is giving you helpers but it's also very modular and you can take some parts of it um, and then adapt some stuff also to your needs but i'm also not no super um, networking expert but um, i think there's one thing called mdns one module which will be used for discovery or something yeah very much on a shaky ground yeah. any other questions I think you mentioned uh, random number, gen random number generators before. I think that there is some more research going on now. Uh, I'm just interested in the topic because it seems very complex to do this. And uh, that how the system is going to rely on something where in the closed computer system we don't have a source of entropy, or am I not correct? So I don't know where you want to produce anything that comes close to a random number. Um, I'm also a cryptographer, but there is one uh, repository, I think, which is independent from Ethereum, which is called the RAN DAO, which is kind of random number DAO, like DAO in losing all the money. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is kind of like a distributed organization where people are um, putting this entropy, I think, and I think it is also in, in the, in the in, in implemented like this in, in, in the future chain. They actually keep putting this entropy inside within their um, within their block proposals or or applications. So, we, we, but I'm not prepared for this. What I what I got is that you got if you do this randomness on a distributed way by yeah, putting this entropy from outside into the chain by the validators who are running or validating the chain. 
Yeah, that's all I understand. So everybody tries to do something that seems to be random, and then you mesh it all together, and then it is random because it's visual. Yeah, and so I think the, the idea is that, that those relatives would have to commit to values beforehand, yeah. and then after a while, they, it is known that they have to reveal, and because they have to commit it, and because they, they all have to do the same game, they basically, therefore, the result is random, except if all <coughs> of them were collaborate against you, then there is. But at least it's, if there is one validator which is honest, then uh, it's, it's a good random opportunity. Okay, that's good. So it, it, it just requires to be one, one of them to be honest, which is, I think, good enough. <laughs> yeah, and you can have a look at this research forum, and a lot of these threads are dedicated into random number generation because. Um, yeah, I also had no real feeling for this before, but it seems to be a hard topic. Uh, and and this is actually one reason for the beacon chain at all, that, that the Garrett, um, yeah, just this random number generation solidified. Well, I really been using the rank talking because I thought you wanted to switch to um, the special signatures like utility. Maybe it is. So I'm maybe <laughs> this is a too deep question for me. Um, I have uh, heard both of the words, but um, not deep enough in the context to, to answer this. Yeah. Sorry, could you repeat I didn't understand. What was the topic? Uh, about the random numbers. So oh, okay. uh, because I said what the idea to move to where uh, definitely if I have racial signature um, scheme to generate numbers instead of the run for I have no idea if this is still the claim or not. So definitely is an alternative blockchain project yeah. uh, that was described better. Yeah. Okay. Which is kind of very advanced, I would say. Also compared to Ethereum, um, yeah, that's what we think. Um, I wanted to know if you ever uh, looked into. We still have a problem of uh, examining the network. Like there is some uh, in terms of log explorers, there's still mm -hmm. only Etherscan who can um, uh, grab some some values, um, especially going into internal transactions and uh, the smart contracts. Are there some kind of complexity? And it seems like uh, Ethereum JS would be very uh, suited for a backend of like uh, uh, a data aggregator or a blockchain explorer. I don't, I don't know. It might be a, a bit of a limited uh, uh, a thing or like a topic. But so you, you never. I'm, I think many libraries which are run on the web using some Ethereum JS libraries, um, like MetaMask or also blockchain explorers for representing accounts, for representing transactions. Um, so I just can give you the very general answer that if the, if the existing solutions are not satisfactory, then you, you probably could use also Ethereum JS libraries to build some things better. Oh yeah, my, my question was if there is in the team, like because you said you're, you're mainly doing infrastructure developer tools, uh, focused work, and uh, for me, like I work mostly front end, so having that data would be so awesome, but it's but it just cannot if that came from uh, some things. And if there would be an infrastructure <coughs> project like uh, providing more information about um, those hard hard to access uh, uh, data points, would be nice. Mm. Yeah, well, what what I'm actually using at the moment for for accessing the blockchain is this is kind of the setup that I use either Web3.js or Web3.py, and I connect this to Infura, which is what I mentioned earlier, where you just have to access just a simple API access to the, um, the blockchain, and then I request there with the Web3 method some information about the blocker or something, and that's what I found most um, convenient. Um, but it's probably depending very much on the... Oh, that's what, we, what I do now, is yeah, that what I'm trying to ask you? Actually, I'm, yeah, I'm also somewhat far from the front end side in terms of the compare. Yeah, so this may be a simple uh, question, but um, how agnostic is your EVM implementation to other layers of the Ethereum stack, like networking, for example, and so on? Could I just plug in a different like, networking layer to the EVM? Do you mean virtual machine or yes. the client? Um, the virtual machine. Okay, because the virtual machine has nothing to do with the network layer. <coughs> this is just a virtual machine, it's just a code execution. Okay. Where you just get the, um, the 
bytecode, you give the bytecode in and um, you can close for the executor and the line is compassion and the result is compassion. It has nothing to do with anything else on, on the view. No, um, what would have to do with anything else would be the client implementation, where things are really com coming together and where we have this network layer and we're connecting to the nodes and exchanging data and on top um, then synchronizing the blockchain and then running blocks with a virtual machine. I'm not sure if I have it right. How far is your client implementation? There's this project uh, working on a complete client in, in JavaScript? This is completely in, in development and it's in only development. Okay. So um, you can, can run this as a node uh, command line command and this is starting to sync the blockchain and pass the mode and, and gets the blockchain up to date. And, um, not super fast, but also not super slow. Um, but uh, I can't give any estimate on where we are and on the six months or so. Uh, what is the relation between the QMJS team and the Ganache team? Because Ganache is supposed to be part of the QMJS, like I mean, it's a pretty cool JS RPG. Is there an overlap of the developer and the computer separate teams? No, that's completely separate. Um, so, um, so Ganache is, um, it's apart from Truffle, um, um, spinning up a simulated blockchain environment. Directly that they have. And they're often like kind of uh, um, requests, um, uh, back, back uh, requests uh, from Ganache to us because they're using our, uh, our base layer library. Um, but there's no, um, there's no overlap. If I have time, I have a yeah. very basic question about sharding uh, because uh, it's changed recently a lot and I couldn't keep up with everything. So um, how is now, uh, when, when you want to group data or transactions to a specific shard, how do you make sure that these transactions are not in conflict with uh, data on other shards? So how, how uh, so the question is like, how do you make sure the charts are not conflicting each other, except by like executing all the charts on one last chart? Um, one general thing is that there's very much work in progress, and there's not very much really specified out. Um, but what 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 type of conflicts do you have? Well, in, in I mean, all the if, uh, yes. If, for example, if I uh, uh, reference uh, data on a different chart um, and I assert that the data should have a certain value and on this different chart there could be a, a, a change of state without me knowing about this on my chart in the meantime. So. Um, Therefore, if I reference data in a different chart, then I somehow must uh, make sure that uh, uh, between now and when the other chart commits to the beacon chain, there is no uh, state change in that particular value of the different chart. So how, how is that ensured between? I mean, that, that, that's what the beacon chain is for, to get these charts synchronized. And I think it's all this <coughs> depending on, on computer clock time. So I think there is this kind of slots, it's called slots um, in the beacon chain, which are Eight seconds, I think, which this is synchronized really by the like, time of synchronizing. Um, but I, I'm not sure about these, these okay. kind of questions. I think this also has very much to do with this <coughs> synchronous versus asynchronous transaction mechanism. So um, if you're doing a cross shard to being synchronous, then at the end, um, um, of the, you, you, you're at, at least you're sure that at the end of the your, every chart is one step further. Um, yeah, but, but for me, it's so, so very much maybe, maybe this is good to, to uh, have this discussion later on. So just to, yeah. to, to generalize the question a bit, uh, if I take uh, charting in a very traditional database, uh, I, I always have a key against which I chart. So let's say, okay, all those customers between numbers one and a thousand are on this chart. And if I am going to know something, it's, uh, I know which chart to ask. 
So the question would be against what is a charge and against what kind of property? Yeah. Or maybe that's a bit uh, I think I'll generalize. No, no, completely, completely a view on this, but I, I think it's not, this is less like the sharding of we just randomly stuck things apart um, and then can use the system as it was before. This is more like, as, as I would imagine, that um, one application will probably stay on one shard as, as much as it can because it will be some kind of difficult to get things back and forth. And I also still not clear picture if about the benefits that this, this is actually integrated and about the, about the limitations. Yeah, it's kind of probably very open discussion. Hope that that's a clear picture of the performance in this discussion. Okay. Uh, okay. okay, I think we close it for questions. Uh, before we go to socializing, we have um, one small uh, announcement from uh, Sultan. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sultan. I just want to talk a little bit. It's going to be three minutes, maybe. About, uh, but can I have the screen? <laughs>